and thank you all so much for joining. My name is Agata Brzezowska. I'm Polish, if you cannot tell by the sound of my surname. Please feel free to connect and reach out to me on LinkedIn. I am one of the recruiters here at Splunk, so I'd be happy to tell you more about our career opportunities, have a chat about working here or put you in touch with the right person. We are all very excited to have you here today. Our team in Poland is growing incredibly fast and we are constantly on the lookout for the top talent. So today we would like to tell you more about us. We have five panelists, great leaders at Splunk who will tell us more about what it is that they do, about their teams, technology and openings in their departments. Um, to start with, Martin will talk us through working in the Krakow office. Navid will give us an overview of the engineering effectiveness. Then Steve will talk about Splunk APM instrumentation. Igor will give us an introduction to getting data in, and Paolo will tell us more about tech ops and supporting Splunk Cloud. You will have an opportunity to ask questions to our panelists. Please write them in the chat section and we will try to answer all of them at the end of the webinar. Please don't be shy. Before I pass on to Martin, I'd like to share a video about how Porsche is bringing data to everything with Splunk. Enjoy. This famous quote by Ferry Porsche, he looked around and did not find the car he was dreaming of and then he decided to build it on its own. Because it shows the passion and it, it shows um, that he had a vision and this is something uh, we are doing from then on. Imagine how Porsche started. You know? Um, we built 52 cars in two years. Now we're building more than 250 cars per day. There must be something special between Porsche and uh, the customers of Porsche. Digitalization is a story of complexity. Though we are building up a whole digital ecosystem, we are talking not about cars anymore, we are talking about luxury mobility. And that's our target and that changes the whole company. Our customers are living more and more in a complete digital world. But I'm also sure that most of our customers love to get a physical touch point. So I think we need both. We always need the feeling. We always have to, to touch the car and the inside of the car. Yeah? And we have to bring the digital experience and really the, the real world. We have to bring it in, together in a perfect way. Data is the center of the whole story. Therefore, I think uh, Splunk is quite a good part for us. The Taycan for Porsche is, a, is an entry in a new market. It's his first electric Porsche. For Porsche, data was one of the key aspects to bringing the Taycan to life. We are open a new chapter with our all-electric Taycan. We have the data to everything era, where we are using data to get more performance, to get more insights. Splunk has spread in our organization very wide. We have over 400 users a day. Splunk helps this charging ecosystem um, by actually making sure that the charging experience for the, for the customer is the, what he expects from a Porsche. It's a revolution product for Porsche. Splunk is helping us in that effort because we are connecting the charging infrastructure and the car. Splunk provides us a single source of proof. Yeah, data is definitely uh, helping to achieve the goal of getting the most out of everything. It might be an IT application, it might be a business need, it might be helping the customer or even using car design. The most important thing for Porsche is customer experience, and that is design, performance and the services. And I'm quite sure that our customers, they feel that. They feel that, that all the passion we bring into it, it's not always just the best, it's intelligent. You know? Getting the most out of everything. Intelligent performance without data is not possible. Splunk helps us to really turn data into doing. That's the Porsche way. To crack it. So back in 2019, January of 2019, I started working with a mature startup called SignalFX. 
And a signal effects, we've established the presence in Krakow. Uh, signal effects' core business was, and still is, post-acquisition, observability and monitoring. So the original office that we are still in was opened up back then, in January of 2019, and we've grown to about uh, 35 engineers prior to Splunk acquiring us in August of 2019. Post-acquisition, Splunk has done some due diligence and decided that uh, Krakow was a great location to continue building this major R&D site. Uh, what was important for all the folks here and what is important going forward as well is that both companies had a similar DNA. It was a very, being a very strong technological, technology company building solutions for engineering teams. So it's engineers building for engineers. So the integration of signal effects has been very smooth uh, and uh, in fact the smoother I've ever seen and I've been on a few of those both on the receiving end, i.e. being acquired and acquiring. Um, from the very beginning, um, crack of R&D location had a very well established and defined philosophy. We wanted to be different uh, than other companies that are in Krakow or some of the other companies. And one of the most important aspects of that uh, was something I like to call site parity. By that I mean that Krakow is a location which is an integral and important part of R&D efforts uh, of Splunk, but we also maintain a very high degree of autonomy and decision-making ability so that we can be productive in our time zone and we don't have to wait for crucial architectural or product management decisions to be made elsewhere, i.e. in California, for example. So in a nutshell, this is not a location where unwanted projects are placed, nor is it a bug fixing or maintenance outfit, quite the opposite. From the get-go, we started working on important and meaningful projects, and that trend continues till today. And parity also means that we extend all the benefits and programs that US-based employees have over to Krakow. So for example, we all have the same compensation structure. I'll touch upon that a little later. We work on the same equipment, which is most, in our case, it's like high-end high MacBook Pros. We have very similar benefit packages, although there are some regional differences because obviously we use Medicover and Multisport, for example, which are not present in US. We have the same engineering processes uh, that we also have an ability to drive and change from Krakow. So once again, an integral part of Splunk engineering ecosystem, and we have a very clear voice and input into decision-making on the engineering level. And as a company, we also remain or have been re very active prior to COVID, which has changed things a bit for everybody. But we've been very active in local engineering community. We participated in many um, conferences such as Geekon, DevOps, uh, as sponsors, but also as presenters. We've also helped to bootstrap DevOps Days uh, Krakow edition and we continue to partner uh, with them. We were taking and planning on taking part in JAG events. We have uh, broad plans to organize meetups and hackathons in our office. We hope COVID situation clears up quickly so that we can start doing that. And uh, during this presentation, you hear about um, new teams that we're forming in Krakow, but I'd like to give you a taste of what's already been built in terms of teams out here. And uh, I'd like to mention some of the well-established uh, teams that are working already out of Krakow. So in no particular order of size of importance, uh, we have the following teams plus few others that are not covered. Uh, so site reliability engineering team that um, although is autonomous in Krakow is obviously a part of a larger SRE effort of Splunk. Uh, these are engineers responsible for our cloud infrastructure, which primarily is AWS, Google Cloud and Azure. And in general, they make sure that our software is scalable and highly reliable. Uh, we also have application teams. Uh, these teams build new functionalities in our products simply. So very classical back-end, middle tier, and front-end engineers, a good mix of folks with strong Java skills, and front-end engineers with JavaScript and uh, mostly Angular and React as our primary front-end uh, framework. Uh, we also have integration teams. And these are folks who are responsible for building integrations for collecting all kinds of data from system metrics for infrastructure components to custom, to even custom data from our customers' applications. Usually that's done through APIs we uh, enable our customers to use. And we have a very broad range of pre-built integrations that our customers can use out of the box. And that is, uh, that, that tool set is continuously growing. Uh, there are many, many technologies. So the integration teams are very varied in terms of the skill set. Another team that's uh, based out of Krakow is called Quality Engineering. 
Um, all of the above teams that I've mentioned are classical Scrum teams, which means they have embedded test engineers. So our Krakow-based quality engineering team is responsible for building frameworks and providing solutions for those other teams so that we can have somewhat unified process for testing of our software. We do not enforce it, we encourage the teams. Um, but usually it helps if the frameworks are in place. Uh, the quality engineering team is also, they're also custodians of quality standards. Uh, we also have test automation team, which uh, works in close collaboration with quality engineering team, but is mostly responsible for specifically automation frameworks, or even more specifically some of the recent work they've been doing is based on UI automation. Uh, then there's also a very strong team uh, composed of engineers who specialize in application security, in our case, cloud application security specifically. And their role is to make sure that all of our products, which you know we sell to various uh, governments, for example, uh, are fully secure. And this is a very interesting work and that is something we want to do more and more in Krakow. And last but not least, we also have technical support teams who help our customers with whatever technical problems they might have. Um, but in contrast to some other support teams I've seen in the past in other organizations, uh, the guys, unfortunately it's just guys on that team so far, uh, are very skilled engineers uh, as our products are very technical. So they really get into the technical weeds, they do write code, they develop a lot of their own uh, software tooling as well. We can move on to the next bullet point. And uh, as one of the last topics, I'd like to briefly cover our compensation philosophy. So all of our employees are employed on full-time basis. Umowa o pracę na czas nieokreślony. Sorry for the non-Polish speakers here. Uh, we're in process of implementing a copyright tax break, koszty uh, uzyskania przychodu. And in addition to that, uh, pretty much every employee of Splunk is eligible for bonus, which ranges from 10 to either 25 or 30 percent, I can't remember, based on secure, uh, seniority. Uh, and our bonus is a little different than most companies, as it is, as it is composed of two factors. So basically, 50 percent of that bonus is based on your performance, and 50 percent of that bonus is based on the performance of company, which historically has been always over 100 percent. So in short, it can and often is more than the actual number in terms of the bonus. And then there is RSUs, restricted stock units, which are a grant of shares each of our employee receives. These stocks mature over a four year period. And after a first year with the company, you receive 25% of your original grant. And then each quarter of the year, you receive the portion of the remainder of the grant. Uh, by receive, I mean those uh, shares end up in your E-Trade account and you're free to do whatever you choose with them. You can keep them, wait for the stock to appreciate even more, or you can sell them at the day of the maturation. <clears throat> and finally, we have the program called ESPP, which is Employee Stock Purchase Plan, which allows you to accumulate uh, up to 15% of your salary during a six-month period. And then the end of that period, Splunk buys you stock of Splunk with a minimum discount of 15%. I say minimum because the final discount depends on what has been happening to the stock price in that six month period. In case of the stock appreciating in that period, that discount can be much larger. For example, in last period, uh, it was well over 50%. I cannot say how much exactly, but it was way over 15%. So you can see that uh, we have a very comprehensive compensation plan for our employees. And I'm not covering all the other benefits, which would take us well over an hour, I think. And I think it's one of the best uh, packages in Krakow right now. Um, as the last thing I want to talk about is the office. And, well, before I jump into this, maybe I'll uh, tell you that we are currently about 65 employees, 65 plus because the number changes almost, well, weekly for sure. Uh, all of the folks right now are fully remote and for the time being and foreseeable future, I think we will remain working remote as the COVID situation is getting uh, worse in Poland. Uh, our office is very centrally located at Nowy Klepasz. For those of you who know Krakow, you guys know that this is a pretty easy place to get into. We do have some parking space and uh, public transportation is also pretty decent in that area. Um, and to wrap it up, I want to show you some pictures of the office, which is in a very funky brick building. I like to call it warm industrial. Uh, we're still doing a lot of, um, lot of a lot of work on the office, like we're replacing desks with fully automated movable ones, sending desks. So there's a lot of uh, work on that front as well, but 
these are these pictures are a little older, so things look a lot better right now. Uh, my predictions are that we'll remain in that location for at least three years because we do have um, expansion space and we can grow there to a quite sizable organization. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Navid now. And she's going to tell you more about new teams that we're building in Krakow, some of which already have been bootstrapped and there are some both being onboarded currently. Over to you, Navid. Thanks. Thank you very much, Martin, for the great introduction. I haven't had the pleasure of uh, visiting the office, but i um, so looking forward to it, hopefully post-COVID. Uh, we can all be there. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Navid Rezvani. I'm the Vice President of Engineering, uh, Engineering Effectiveness. I am based out of California in US, and I lead an engineering organization that is somewhat um, horizontal. By horizontal, I mean I lead uh, functions that are um, impacted and are impactful for the entire engineering organization, such as the first one would be quality engineering that Martin touched on um, a little bit in his um, introduction. He called them software developers and software developer engineers in test. These are uh, the main objective of these folks is basically to remove our customers out of finding issues in our product when we send them out. These people are advocates for our customers and they take care of everything and anything from end-to-end -end testing strategy at the functional level, making sure that they have the best framework for testing and they find issues before our customers find them. The next pillar within my organization is responsible for performance and system test engineering. And this is another layer above functional testing. So these folks are highly skilled in doing benchmarking of our products, validating scale and limit for uh, various features that we put out. Uh, next uh, pillar is developer platform and release engineering. So this is anything around CICD, uh, this making sure that there is continuous operations, building robust tools, framework, and infrastructure to make sure that we can make life easier for developers to focus on their code development and not worry about how the, the back factory works pretty much. Um, next pillar is engineering productivity. These folks are responsible for making sure that all everybody who gets hired in the engineering function in the product and technology groups, they are um, during their first two days of training and onboarding, they learn about the company, the culture, how they build their uh, development environment. How do they, where do they find the information that they need? Basically be productive from day one. Also in an ongoing basis, they focus on removing um, human toil, uh, basically making sure that they remove waste from the process. Product security or application security, as Martin mentioned, this is building in security from day one into everything and anything that you develop. So also providing um, consolidated security assessment with clear risk for the teams to assess how secure their products are and build the security posture in, in our products. And last but not least is the technical program management, um, building really practices, very strong practices to be able to manage end-to-end -end large scale programs to ensure that releases are on time and we meet customer um, objectives. So I do have a couple of my leaders here from uh, performance engineering system tests and also uh, software developers in tests that will be here to answer any questions you may have. Our teams, the estates, are also embedded into some of the scrum teams that Martin mentioned. Uh, so we work very closely with one of the speakers later on, Igor, uh, who is building a large team as well in uh, Krakow. With that, I'm going to hand it over to the next speaker, Steve Flanders, who is a director of engineering in uh, the observability area. Steve, take it away. Thanks so much. 
Hello, everyone. Yeah, so my name is Steve Flanders. I work on the observability team focusing on how we actually collect data for our application performance monitoring, APM, as well as infrastructure monitoring products today. Uh, the observability products are basically a joining of two acquisitions that Splunk made over the last year, being SignalFX and Omniscient. I actually joined as part of the Omniscient acquisition. And one of the interesting things that we're doing from our uh, data ingestion perspective is we focus a lot on open source technology. In fact, we are, Splunk as a whole, is the main contributor to a open source project called Open Telemetry. And we actually are looking to grow that team in many ways to help support instrumentation needs for both application performance monitoring or distributed tracing as it's known, uh, as well as for metrics and eventually logging capabilities. The industry as a whole is really moving to open source and open standards based instrumentation and data collection. And we're looking to help accelerate those efforts and really make it easier for end users and cloud providers, as well as other vendors to be able to take advantage of this telemetry data uh, and then leverage the power of our backends today through streaming analytics and real time alerting capabilities, uh, as, la as well as the ability of just handling the enormous amount of data that's being generated. So what I'd like to do is kind of walk you through a little bit of what open telemetry is. Uh, if you are familiar with observability, you have probably heard of the three pillars of observability being traces, metrics, and logs. These are actually different data sources for which you can actually monitor, report, and of course, observe on. For each of these different verticals, there's actually a bunch of work that needs to go in in order to actually generate this telemetry data, emit it in a format that can be accepted, and then of course, process that data. Uh, as you can see here, for each of the different data sources, things like APIs or implementations are actually language specific. So a lot of work needs to be good, needs to go in to kind of go deep into each of the language aspects and ensure that you have the right hooks uh, to emit telemetry data in an efficient way. Uh, in fact, performance is one of the top considerations here for some of the work that we're doing. What we provide is a client library that uh, end users can actually add to their application to have it emit telemetry data. Now, anything that you do like this is going to introduce some amount of overhead, uh, but one of our goals is to minimize that overhead as much as possible and make it really easy for people to get this telemetry data out without having to modify their code. Uh, we do that through something called automatic instrumentation, or sometimes it's called bytecode manipulation. So the idea is we can provide client libraries that are packaged that end up becoming either dependencies or runtime parameters that will actually go in and instrument someone's application for them. And this is regardless of language. So Java, Go, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, you name it. Uh, and our goal is to do that in the most efficient way possible and to get that telemetry data to our, our backends. Uh, and in the case of Splunk, we do things a little bit differently in that we collect all of this telemetry data. Most other competitors in the space are actually sampling this data, which means they only collect a subset of it. We're looking to collect all of the data and do that in an efficient way. So if you next, uh, what you'll see is that the Open Telemetry Project is actually looking to, oh, sorry, uh, go back to two more. There we go, right there. So the Open, uh, one more forward. There we go. So the Open Telemetry Project is actually looking to uh, solve uh, all of this, like the actual API, the client library aspect. It actually offers a collector or an agent that can actually process this data, and it handles all the wire formats, protocols, context propagation things that are very common in the monitoring and observability space. Open Telemetry does not actually provide a backend. So you would actually configure the data that's being emitted from Open Telemetry to be sent to, say, Splunk. And then Splunk would then process that data and provide a way to actually visualize it, alert on it, and give you some rich analytic capabilities. Uh, Open Telemetry is actually not controlled by Splunk. It is a vendor agnostic product. It's actually part of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, or CNCF. Uh, we are main contributors to it, but there are actually a lot of contributors, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. One more forward. 
And the specific jobs that we uh, uh, forward, here we go, the specific jobs that we are uh, hiring for are really in the tracing aspect for APM. So it has a lot to do with the APIs and client libraries that actually go into the application themselves. Uh, all of this work is open source, so we don't actually have any proprietary information here. Uh, you have the opportunity to work in open source communities to actually leverage uh, and work with other vendors and end users and cloud providers natively. Next. And then from a contributing and adopting perspective, this is really a cool opportunity because OpenTelemetry actually has broad community adoption. In fact, all three major cloud providers today uh, are contributing to OpenTelemetry and actually instrumenting their backend services in it. In addition, all major vendors in the monitoring and observability space are also partaking. As I mentioned, Splunk is the number one contributor. And from an end user perspective, we're seeing some big name companies in the industry actually get involved as well. Not only are they helping accelerate the OpenSymmetry project, they are actually running OpenSymmetry in their production environments. There are also a variety of other projects that are starting to adopt and leverage OpenTelemetry too. Uh, in the case of CNCF, there is a distributed tracing product called Jaeger that is completely open source. Uh, Jaeger is actually moving to the OpenTelemetry collector. You can see other examples of that here as well. Uh, and I provided links. We can share out this afterwards if you're interested in looking. One of the great things is since it's all open source, it's very easy to kind of see what's going on in this community. So kind of wrapping up here, what we're looking for is really to help accelerate building these client libraries. As I mentioned, we're, we're covering all the different languages, all the major languages today. Uh, there's really needs to hook really deep into all the different fra uh, frameworks and libraries and support both more legacy code as well as some of the latest and greatest cutting edge stuff that's coming out. Uh, we're looking to do this as we help accelerate people to the OpenSymmetry project. Uh, there was actually a previous generation of tooling called Open Tracing, so helping bridge that gap today. Uh, and also we're looking to help make it very portable for the data that's being generated. We call this semantic conventions. So ensuring that all the metadata that we're emitting for these data sources is richly and consistently being uh, tacked on. Uh, so a lot of cool opportunities here to really help build these client libraries, as well as ensure that we have the right test matrices and performance in place uh, to ensure that what we are providing to the community is efficient and doesn't impact applications. With that, I would like to turn it over to Igor, who's gonna talk about Splunk's GDI and how you get data into Splunk. Great, uh, thank you, Steve. And this is a perfect segue. In addition to the open telemetry, we have a number of other uh, tools and products that's been built over the years and we'll continue working on them to make it easy for our customers to get data into Splunk. And that's uh, the goal of my team uh, is really to make it as frictionless as possible, as easy as possible to get data into Splunk because all the value uh, is analyzed through the analytics. So to do that, you need data. And uh, we have a, a team that we internally call GDI, which stands for getting data in. Um, we currently have teams in San Francisco Bay Area, Vancouver, Canada. We have engineers in Ahmedabad, India, and we're building a brand new team in, in Krakow. Uh, the manager of that team has already started there a couple of weeks ago. We have few engineers who are gonna be starting in November, December, and we're looking to continue hiring her well into the next year to build a sizable team focusing on GDI in Krakow. Next slide, please. So what are we working on? And what can Splunk ingest? Uh, pretty much anything. And that's the beauty of Splunk. It's been built as a uh, unstructured data store for, for logs initially. The very first version of Splunk Enterprise came to market back in 2006. And uh, it is really able to ingest any textual data without any structure. And that's sort of your Swiss Army knife that enables a lot of different use cases that our customers are using Splunk for. So over the years, as I mentioned, we have a number of different products and tools that I'm gonna highlight in the next uh, few minutes uh, <clears throat> that we are investing in to make it as easy as possible for our customers to get data into Splunk to enable analytics for security, IT, and many other use cases that our customers are using Splunk for. Uh, next slide, please. Splunk Universal Forwarder is our original agent. Uh, it is a product that our customers deployed on the end nodes. Uh, you can deploy it on your laptops, you can deploy it on your servers. 
uh, and it's able to collect the data from local file systems uh, and send it to Splunk. It is also able to do many other things. It can run scripts to collect additional data and send it to Splunk. Um, uh, very scalable uh, 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 product uh, that does a lot of things um, that uh, mostly uh, written in, in C++ with some extension points that my, one of my teams is really focusing on and continuing to improve. Uh, there today, I think last time I checked, there are over 130 million instances of universal forwarders that are deployed across the world and used by our customers. Um, next slide, please. Splunk Heavy Forwarder is similar to the universal forwarder. It's used for the collection of data on the end nodes, uh, but it's also able to do a lot more processing locally. If you want to offload your indexers, uh, these are the machines that are used to, to index and store the data. Uh, if you want to offload some data processing from those servers, uh, you do some of this on the heavyweight forwarders. Um, and so uh, typically this is used by our customers to uh, pull the data from third party APIs and do some additional processing on the end nodes. You would deploy a tier of heavyweight forwarders uh, to collect the data and then send those uh, send the data to to the indexers. Next slide. In addition uh, to the forwarders who are speaking a proprietary protocol with indexers, which we call S to S, it stands for Splunk to Splunk. Uh, we also have uh, a protocol which is called HEC. It stands for HTTP Event Collector, that is used to send data to Splunk via HTTP. Um, and the use case here, you can instrument your custom application to send the data to Splunk. Uh, there are a number of other products that I'm going to talk in the next few slides that use in HEC as a protocol to send data to Splunk. So we continue working on improving the performance and semantics of the, uh, both HEC and S2S protocols. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the open source connectors that my team also works on. These are uh, kind of technology specific push based connectors that collect the data from specific technologies. For example, if you want to monitor and, and collect logs uh, on your Kubernetes cluster and send them to Splunk, uh, you would deploy Splunk Connect for Kubernetes, configure it, point it to your Splunk, and we'll use Hack to send data into Splunk. So the number of different connectors that are uh, outlined on this page, we, uh, we continue uh, in improving those and building new ones. For example, with the recent uh, COVID situation, a lot of our customers wanted to collect data from, from Zoom and other uh, similar products. And so the team built the Splunk Connect for Zoom that's able to collect your Zoom data and send it into Splunk. Next slide, please. Another area that we are heavily investing in is what we call technology add-ons, uh, or shortly TAs. Uh, TAs are deployed on Splunk infrastructure, and these are Splunk applications that are used to uh, interpret data from third-party products and make it usable for our premium applications, uh, as well as for kind of any, any user of Splunk. So, uh, you can think of it typically there is a, a, a one technology add-on per source product. Uh, so if you have, let's say, a Juniper firewall in your uh, organization, you want to collect data from that, you would deploy a Juniper firewall TA uh, that you can find on our app store, which is Splunk, uh, called Splunk Base. You would deploy it on your Splunk infrastructure and that piece of software will interpret, will parse the data coming from the Juniper firewall, parse it in the right way, and provide a lot of different enrichment uh, uh, methods for the upstream applications to use that data. Uh, there are over 60 different technology add-ons that my team works on, uh, and then uh, uh, as with connectors, we keep building uh, new ones based on the priorities, based on our, uh, the, the desires from our customers. Next slide, please. SplunkDB Connect is a product that's used by uh, over 4,000 uh, Splunk customers uh, that is able to both uh, collect the data, reach out to relational databases, get the data from there and ingest it into Splunk, as well as uh, run some searches into Splunk, in, in Splunk and output the data back into the relational database. Very popular product, very large and complex, mostly Java-based uh, that one of my teams is focusing on. Next slide. 
Splunk Stream is another product uh, that we have, and that is used for passively collecting data from the network. Uh, not all the data is stored in logs. Uh, some of the data can only be found and intercepted on the network. And then we have a dedicated product that our customer use to do that. Uh, this is one of the top data sources for some of the security use cases that, that Splunk has and supports. Next slide. And the last but not the least is Splunk Data Stream Processor. This is a new product that we released to the market about a year ago. This is a standalone streaming product, uh, which is also becoming part of our core platform is gonna play a huge role in the GDI story in the upcoming years. So traditionally Splunk has been kind of a batch operating system. Everything at Splunk is based on search. Uh, so before you run search, you need to uh, collect, index, and store the data. Uh, you can think of uh, DSP as another piece of the platform that's gonna sit uh, right in front of Splunk. And as the data goes by, you can perform a lot of streaming operations. A lot of the same things that you can do in Splunk today at search time, you can do this uh, uh, on the stream of data at ingest time. And that enables a lot of different uh, new use cases for Splunk customers. Um, <clears throat> big, big product which spans multiple teams in Splunk. Uh, my team, next slide please, uh, is responsible for building all the sources and sinks, sources and destinations for uh, DSP. And some of them are listed here. We're collecting data from a number of different uh, cloud data providers as well as other data sources. And then DSP is able to output the data to various destinations. Splunk is one of them. SignalFX is another and, and a few others. And that list, uh, both of this list will grow over time as we're gonna build more and more sources and connectors. This is it for me. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Paolo, who's gonna talk about TechOps team. Hello everybody and uh, thanks Igor. Um, I hope everybody is enjoying the event so far. Uh, please do remember to post any of your questions in the chat and we can get to that afterwards in the Q&A section. Right, I am one of the leaders in the TechOps team. Um, I come from a technical background myself um, and I worked in the TechOps team for about a year before taking over a leadership role within the team. So what is TechOps? Um, as per the title, we are in charge of the technical aspects of day-to-day -day operations within Splunk Cloud. And Splunk Cloud is the Splunk SaaS offering. At a very high level, that means that we deal with incidents relating to customer-facing cloud infrastructure, planning and implementation of changes on that infrastructure, and creating tools to assist and automate some of those tasks. While it may seem like a peer support role, it's not. Um, you can think of it along the lines of a third line infrastructure support role, plus, plus, plus. Um, we have scope to contribute to and also own some aspects of internal tooling, um, build automation, infrastructure management, uh, we get certain input into the architectural aspects and some of the designs and much, much more. Um, our team is made up of people with a wide range of technical expertise. Um, these people come from different backgrounds, some who are um, operating systems or um, former sysads. Um, and we also have some people who come from different backgrounds. We've got a, a Mongo DBA um, as part of our team. And, you know, we, we put all of that together to uh, make the best use of it. Um, now, some of the technologies that the team deals with, uh, which may be a bit interesting, um, we use Puppet at a very large scale. Um, we use Terraform as well as some of the other HashiCorp products, um, Jenkins, GitLab, and a lot of the other uh, more common uh, DevOps type tools. Um, 
everything is primarily based around uh, Linux and the Linux OS. And we do a lot of tooling and automation using um, different scripting languages. We are primarily targeting people who have uh, proficiency in Golang and Python. Um, obviously Go being our preference. And we have a lot of scope to do uh, all sorts of other tool, um, tasks within uh, cloud ops. Currently, uh, we've got teams based out of America, Australia, and London. Uh, we are looking to expand into Krakow. Uh, basically, expanding uh, within Europe gives us the option of expanding our 24-7 capabilities, uh, as well as being able to collaborate a lot better and give us the scope to work on bigger, better projects. Um, it's of huge interest to the members of the team and we try and make sure that um, everybody gets to work on the, the projects that they're most interested in and that they feel they can contribute to. Okay, and I think that's about it from the tech ops side. So I'll hand it back over to Agatha to run uh, the Q&A session. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo. And uh, thank you, thank you to all the panelists for giving us an overview of, of the organizations and departments. Um, attendees, please, if you have any questions, uh, please drop them in the, in the chat. Um, but I have a question um, ready for, for some of you um, today. Um, so here's one, how, how do you value diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what's, what's available at Splunk? Um, I, I can take that. So diversity and inclusion is uh, really critical to our culture here. In fact, we value it. We do have, for those of you who are familiar with objectives and key results, that's one of our key results to make sure that we not only focus on diversity and inclusion, but also equity and belonging. I, I'm really thrilled to see in the list of all the participants, a lot of uh, diverse set of people. Uh, we definitely value that in our culture. We have multiple um, specific groups within Splunk it's not just gender diversity, but background cultural diversity, we definitely value that. If there are any specific questions related to that, um, please come um, either put it in the chat window or, or ask it. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much, Navid. Um, this is another question. I think Martin, you've touched upon it. Um, obviously with the COVID-19 situation right now, we are all working remotely. Uh, perhaps one of you could talk us through the onboarding, the training, and how does it look like in, in such, a, uh, such a specific time? Yeah, I can probably take part of that, Martin. If you wanna start from the local activities, I can just talk about the, the workshops sure. and such. Sure. So I'll, I'll start with like the, the mechanics of it, right? So uh, when you're getting on board at your monitor, your laptop, everything arrives uh, to you via courier and it's uh, pre-configured. All you need to do is just plug it in. Uh, same with all the paperwork, everything else. Uh, in terms of like contract signing and stuff like this, we do everything electronically. It's fully binding for us. Uh, so uh, that's what happens. Uh, in terms of like uh, joining a team and team integrations, you know, we all the teams have uh, switched over to Zoom and they have, uh, depending on the team, we believe in self-organization and self-government uh, of the team to a certain extent, of course. <laughs> uh, so they, they, they run the show, they meet uh, on Zoom, they integrate uh, uh, through Zoom. I do know that unofficially some of the teams uh, do meet outside of that uh, Zoom venue, but obviously it, it's not sanctioned by, by Splunk, but you know, they, they like to do it, they do it. Um, in terms of uh, actual onboarding, uh, we, like as a company, we do believe in a lot of uh, self-servicing in many respects and areas. So we do have a lot of pre-packaged material for you that you can go through trainings. Uh, but, but generally, we also have something called buddy system. So whenever you join Splunk, we buddy you up with someone and that someone is helping you through um, everything there is, uh, you know, you, you could require. Uh, and there's also me, who is uh, always available 24-7 pretty much. And if there's any issues, questions, uh, I'm always available and uh, I can help the new hires. 
Over to Navid. Yeah, so in addition to what Martin mentioned, as I mentioned, one of the, the pillars in my organization is around engineering productivity. Everybody on this call, they're um, engineers. Um, and so uh, what we do after the initial day, after you receive your laptop and you go through all the logistics, there is also, um, uh, we do offer a training, onboarding training, official onboarding training, and there are workshops that are available to you. So you can go through them self-service based, and then you also get um, sometimes very, um, you know, a lot of great keynote speakers uh, join and they talk about the business for Splunk. We talk about various customers for Splunk, how they use our product. That Porsche video, you will see the link later on. So that's one example how our customers use, use our product. But uh, also during that onboarding uh, session, you get to learn more about the specifics. If you are, if you know which, which organization you're going to be joining or what projects you're gonna be working on, sometimes they offer um, just group-based projects. So it's pretty, pretty involved. And we make sure that by the time you reach your own team that you were hired for, you have all the basics to be productive on day one. Perfect. Thank you so much, Martin and Navid. Um, here's another question, an interesting one. What is the real role of Crack of Sight in Splunk's development? I can take that maybe initially and uh, feel free to jump in, folks. So uh, can you, can you uh, clarify the question a bit more or repeat it? <laughs> Uh, so the question is, what's the real role of Krakow site in the in Splunk's development? So uh, perhaps why are we growing so so rapidly and why there's so okay. much investment? Got it. Uh, I think there are three factors that uh, that Splunk uh, has in mind um, with investment in Krakow, uh, and those are actually in a order of importance. I think. So first and foremost, uh, we're looking for qualified top talent engineers and Krakow has plenty of those, absolutely. And I've worked in California in Silicon Valley and I've been out here for over eight years and I can, you know, vouch for that, right? Like I know that the talent here is on par with what's available in, in Silicon Valley. So first of all, we're looking for good talent. Second thing is availability of the talent. Uh, while Krakow is a very competitive marketplace, we as Splunk think that what we offer in terms of type of work, projects, exposure to technologies, and of course compensation is very competitive in this marketplace. So that would be the second factor. So availability of the so talent, availability of talent, and third, of course, cost, right? Like let's not shy away from, from that because it's also an important aspect. Um, but definitely not the not the first consideration of why Splunk is in Krakow. I have, um, I, just to add on to what Martin mentioned, definitely talent pool is, is key for us. We have started building our teams, you know, partner with Igor, as I mentioned, and we've already hired our manager for, for Estet team and, and so on and so forth. But one of the other key objectives for us is follow the sun model. We have the, you know, with the time zone difference, that's really critical when you are working on a project to be able to hand off your work to your colleagues in another time zone so you can go to sleep when they, they wake up in the morning and they that continuity of work is really important. Also consolidation of functions to just kind of ownership goes back to the ownership within uh, Krakow. Uh, you mentioned oh, Igor about building the GDI team. So we are definitely focusing in that uh, space so that they can have really um, you know self-service teams with the tie to their um, base in, in California, but definitely they will be um, supported with uh, product managers, with uh, all the software developers, performance engineers, developers, so that they can collectively deliver um, a feature that is important to the customers. Igor, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think, uh, thanks, David. I think you and Martin uh, covered it. The way, the way I look at this, uh, as Martin mentioned, it is, it is extremely, uh, I would say, challenging to, to keep hiring and expanding here in Bay Area. So I'm personally looking at Krakow uh, to, to go faster from the building the team's perspective and, uh, and getting, uh, getting good, good talent. Uh, it's, a, 
It's a great location. It's a beautiful office that I had a chance to visit back in, in November of last year. Um, uh, and then uh, I think the sort of my medium term goal is to get those teams as autonomous as possible. Uh, as Martin mentioned, I think that's a general principle of this office. Obviously, initially, as we hired these engineers, we're going to uh, help embed them into some of the existing projects, help them get up to speed and ramp up on our products. But uh, uh, sometime uh, early, mid of next year, uh, we're going to kind of transfer full ownership of specific projects and products. They're going to be supported by the product managers. Uh, I think product management team is also looking to hire product managers and crack up directly. So the end goal is to uh, have those teams to be just regular teams. They're just in different location. And as we all learned over the last year, distributed development really works. Um, so that is definitely not an issue. So thank you, thank you so much. And for the, one for the quality engineering team, what kind of frameworks and standards the team are focusing on and what sort of skills are required in this area and how big is the team? So I'm gonna hand it over to Namrata and uh, for, for QA and then Tracy is also on the call with Tim for performance and system tests. Namrata, do you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, so we surely want to build the team uh, and my org size is around 80 to 90 at this point. And we have plans to expand in Krakow for, for software engineering in test. I have already hired a great uh, manager in Krakow and uh, given offer to at least uh, three to four folks. Our plan is to expand it to uh, around 10, 10 uh, uh, at, at some point. As Igor is hiring, uh, we want to make sure we are able to support his organization from quality perspective. From the framework and, and, and the quality team perspective, we do drive quality culture, the software engineering in test, do the actual testing, do a lot of automation. They do build test frameworks and other tools that are needed. Some tools uh, that are mentioned, sorry, I thought someone uh, was speaking. So some tools that are mentioned are listed in, in the Slack channel, but we do have internal tools for the GDI area. Most of the toolings are built using PyTest. So uh, uh, experience with PyTest or Java and coding experience is must uh, for a software engineering in test. Uh, we are not doing manual testing. We are focusing on automation tool framework and, and, and be part of, of the Scrum team. Tracy, do you want to add a little bit about performance and the frameworks that you use for system sure. tests and performance? Sure, sure, Naveed. Um, uh, thank you very much for all the leaders sharing uh, the openings at Krakow. I uh, wanted to go in a little bit about uh, what performance and system testing team is looking in general. Um, as Naveed mentioned, we're, we're looking at um, finding out the um, uh, product boundaries, uh, the team focus on non-functional testing, looking at scalability, reliability, availability, um, the um, uh, un under large scale scenarios, uh, customer based scenario testing is um, our responsibility. Uh, from a tooling and framework perspective, uh, we use a combination of in-house built tools we call Parpanis, as well as some of the open source tools like JMeter um, for um, performance and, and system testing. Uh, the in-house built tool is uh, Python based. So there's uh, a lot of framework development uh, opportunities in this area as well. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention is um, from the uh, from, from the team, uh, we're also helping with the capacity planning, our customer capacity planning, both on-prem and, and some of the cloud customers. Uh, we built a sizing calculator tool that is uh, using Python uh, and machine learning uh, as the sizing model in the back end. Uh, so those are some of the uh, framework and tooling uh, that uh, we're building and using by the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy and Namrata. Um, I have a question for our tech recruiter, Chris Kwiatek. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the application interview and, and hiring process at, uh, at Splunking Faculty. 
per thing. So um, filling, filling out the application, you start by filling out the application on our website, which um, takes around 10 minutes. Um, you have to answer some basic question and put in some basic data. Um, and ideally, of course, attach a CV alongside. Uh, once, this is, once this is done, um, someone from the recruitment team will be in touch with you to, um, to screen you, initially inform you about the interview process and uh, pass along your application. Um, as for the actual process for the technical roles, we usually start with a first round for, um, for first round is a one hour technical interview with either the hiring manager um, or a senior engineer from, uh, from the team that you're applying to. Um, it's also a good opportunity for the candidate to ask some more in-depth questions about the team or project itself, or maybe the tech stack um, or, or, you know, some more, uh, some more details about, um, um, about the work. Um, and if the feedback from the first round is positive, we move to the full round of the interviews, which um, usually consists of four to five interviews maximum. Um, it's a combination of technical design, uh, technical interview, design interview, and, uh, and team fit interviews. Um, once, um, once those are concluded, the team gathers to discuss the feedback and, uh, and make the decision um, on, with regards to, to the offer. Um, apart, apart from Zoom, we use um, Codility whiteboard modes for all technical interviews, um, which essentially is a combination of a virtual whiteboard um, and an IDE with an option to choose a preferred coding language. Um, so I guess that's uh, that's that's a pretty good overview when it comes to when it comes to the whole to the whole process for technical roles. Thank you. Uh, Thank you like so much. To it that if you guys are interested in anything that, uh, you know, if, if you're not ready to apply and you want to find out some more information, myself and Chris are always available. Uh, our emails should be somewhere in the deck. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, of course, as well. So do reach out. Yes. Uh, yes, please feel free to, to connect with, uh, with us or with the, with the panelists. We'll be happy to, um, to have a casual chat if you're, if you're not sure. Um, one question that has just come in, um, what's your delivery cycle? How fast a change new feature is placed in production? And from a dev perspective, it's always exciting to see our work going live. So, um, so the attendee wonders if it's rather continuous delivery or one big release a month or a quarter. I, I was just typing up an answer to it. So I'll start and I'll let the other folks fill in. Uh, and the answer is, as it often is, Depends. Depends on the product, depends on the team, right? So some teams uh, do it much more often and some teams are more of a big bank approach. Uh, and I'll let the, the experts fill in the blanks here. I can go next and then others can, can talk. Um, so we, we do have the uh, product that historically it's been referred to as on-prem or customer managed product. So we go out once a year that those are for really on-prem customers. Then there are others, uh, the um, enterprise cloud, the delivery cycle right now is about six weeks and focusing on getting that down to four weeks. We do have the microservices world and I'll let others you know, the, to, to speak to that, the SaaS delivery that is much, much faster. So we do have the continuous delivery in that model. Igor or Steve or others, you wanna comment on your uh, delivery cycle? Yeah, so I think in general, Splunk is all in on, on cloud and we're going through this transition from traditionally on-prem product and I'm talking about kind of Splunk Enterprise, uh, a core, uh, our, our core product uh, and, and platform. Uh, it was, as I mentioned before, uh, came out to the market in 2006, has been traditionally on-prem. Over the last six, seven years, we've been also running a very successful cloud business that's growing quite a bit. And obviously, shipping something once a year is not good enough for the cloud. So over the last two, three years, uh, we've been working very closely with Navid's organization uh, in shortening that cycle from once a year to twice a year to quarterly, to now six weeks uh, and uh, we'll continue working on that. And when it comes to some of the new products, new uh, cloud services that uh, uh, we're building, uh, those are deployed in the production uh, and a lot, uh, a lot faster, a lot quicker cadence. 
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are at a time. So thank you very much to all the panelists uh, for, for their time today. And uh, we were very excited to, to have all the attendees with us today. Um, please have a look at the jump link, uh, jobs link in the, in the chat section. And feel free to connect with, uh, with myself, with uh, Chris Kwiatek, Martin, or any other panelists to, to ask further questions if, if you're interested. Thank you so much. Thank you.